Steve, I begin with a pledge. Go for it. No direct questions in this entire at home about what happened in the 85 Black Ball final. <laughs> well, Dennis will be upset. Um, but funnily enough, even though I've talked about it plenty of times and also talked about it retrospectively with not actually even thinking about it and not thinking about what it was like then, I sort of talk about it to some degree as if I've watched it as well. So a lot of the how do you feel, I can't remember, it was too bloody long ago. So to some degree, those questions are irrelevant. This was 35 years ago you're talking about. How can I remember? How could anybody remember what they were going through? So effectively, it's dead. But of course, there's a nostalgia thing going on. Me and Dennis still do exhibitions on the strength of it. I feel like a hypocrite because I made the documentary on it. But oh, yeah, um, <laughs> of course you did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, that, was but, 20, that was ten years ago. Yeah, and yeah. I think I think that was an anniversary of it. Yet yeah, I'm so surprised now because it's a story more told than any other in snooker history. And while it was an amazing game for so many reasons, and did a lot for the sport, and had so much backstories, I don't think there's anything left to be said. So this if it gets mentioned, not, this pledge is not going well, is it? No, it is. It can get mentioned well. indirectly. But I don't have any question about it because I don't feel like anyone listening to this is going to learn anything new. I'd be delighted to at least do the 50-year anniversary of it <laughs> and hopefully the 60-year anniversary. Yeah, yeah, and that's it. And only because it means I'm on the planet still yeah. and not underneath it. <laughs> I want to talk about obsession. Going yeah. through everything you have, whether it's snooker, whether it's music, whether it's chess, is being an obsessive key... And in fact, a, a non-negotiable must for dominating a sport. I'm not talking about being good at it. I'm not talking about being mercurial. I'm talking about to dominate a sport for years and years and years is obsessive, almost top of the list. Um, well, it's certainly, you need to be obsessed to become good. Because on various occasions, people are going, oh, how, how many how many hours a day did you practice? I know you go, oh, you're like, yeah, I was a kid, eight hours a day practice. And they go, oh, my God, that must have been tough. You go, no, it was easy. I loved it. Yeah. But for somebody else, the thought of practicing for eight hours a day would bore them stupid. And they're not the people that are going to get good. The person who is prepared to practice a piano for eight hours a day is a concert pianist. And, you know, if there was a world championship, is you know, 10 hours a day, whatever. But it's not a hardship for that person. Mm. So it's hard to judge it as how obsessive you are, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee domination of a sport or a game or something like that. That becomes another issue, whether you seem to have the knack, the temperament, the characteristics that mean you've got that within you as well. But I would have never have thought that I was the type of person who could dominate. I don't feel that's me. In a way, I was playing the part of me when I was dominant, mm. but it, I don't feel like that's me now, and I'm not sure it was me other than when I was doing it. But, of course, I was very good at what I did, yeah. so it came easy to me, and I was on the crest of a wave, and all focus was on me, so it was easy to focus in on dominating because mm-hmm. that was required, and I was enjoying the prospect. And then the moment... <clears throat> I stopped dominating, the bubble burst, I felt like a different character. But for the time being, how you get in that zone of being a dominant force, I don't really know. Do you think, but the obsessiveness equals preparation, Mm -hmm. and preparation equals a subconscious reckoning in your head that you are ready to handle it. It's like turning up for an exam when you haven't read the book, and you know. You can blag it all you want, but you know. But when you've read that book and you understand it, you can be nervous and you can think you're going to fail and you can have self-doubt, but you are ready. You have prepared an obsessiveness. I've never heard of anybody dominate and say they weren't obsessed. Well, over the years of practicing, you try to work out what's the right amount to try and work out what's the right type of practice. And you find yourself practicing for what you consider is for guilt that you need to practice to make sure that you're not underprepared because if you did go in underprepared you'd have that niggling thing at the back of your brain knowing full well so over practice is the only way to do it i'm not saying over practice is how you feel about it but you certainly make sure you put enough hours in because Mm. you want to make sure you're prepared so for that reason yeah i suppose 
you're going to find the weak drop by the wayside a bit mm. and, and you're going to get the weirdos left and and it, there is a little bit of it that's yeah. it, it, there's something strange about the <clears throat> I've, I've noticed i feel i've noticed anyway not saying it's absolutely a prerequisite but if you take stephen Hendry, he's not a normal person mm. trust me he's not and nor am i and nor's ronnie and nor's john higgins who in some ways they're normal but in other ways there's something very ad- abnormal about them whether they're they're, they're slightly unhinged in in a nice way whether there's a i don't know like a, 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 on the spectrum somewhere that you know in 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 the positive way um but i see a lot of other players in the game who i feel oh he's quite a normal person mm. and he hasn't got that weird bit that makes him a winner is it mm. and that's how i view it yeah well you've got it we can just look at your record collection for that but i, I wonder do you not realize how obsessive you are because when i read about your excitement and love of chess you had to become head of the board and when i read when you look at your music obsession and we'll get onto that a lot later. It's DJ and Glastonbury. It's making albums. It's having a radio show that is actually existed for over a decade. That's obsession. And your snooker was an obsession. What else have you been? Ob- let finish the jigsaw because that's only three things I know. No, did did you that's... collect things when you were four? Is there other things that you went once you start, you take it to a point, and then you don't care about it anymore? Um, I've never really been obsessed with chess. I just learned to play chess from young. You were ahead of? No, I, I, I came, I, I actually uh, admitted that I liked chess yeah. to um, to do, and I did an interview with Chess Monthly, which is, you know, it's it's out there, Chess Monthly. I hope it's still going. It's a good, you know, if you're, if you're. The problem is, yeah, yeah. yeah. And because you're obsessed. I, yeah. Because I, because I, had, I, I, and, and then the next phase was I was asked if I wanted to become the president of the British Chess Federation. And I thought it was a nice thing to do, even though I wasn't really able to do much for them. Mm. I've made a side wave and move. I might be a patron now. I don't. But I, I, I was, I loved, I liked playing chess when I was at school, but I, I've never been obsessed, obsessed with it. Okay. But collecting records. That's an addiction that mm. you need therapy for. Yeah. I need, but you know, but, and, and as I'm getting older, it's just started dawning on me. Only just, or perhaps I should have thought about it earlier. What am I doing? Mm. Still collecting records. I mean, you can do it when you're 20, but not when you're 60. I mean, like you know, they're just going to accumulate. Somebody's going to have to burn them all. If you play three albums a day <laughs> at an hour a day for 365 days a year, it's just over a thousand records, Steve. You you own, that's that's what five percent of the records you own. So there are records you, that even if you listen to three albums a day, you will take ten years before you could get through your collection. But the most important thing for the collector is they've got it, yeah, and they can listen to it when they want to because they've acquired it, yeah, and it's not sitting in somebody else's collection or it's not sitting in a record rack. You've actually harvested it for your own yeah. personal possession, and it's an awful thing that those things are really. In a way, I quite like, even though I hate them, the people who just get downloads like yourself. Mm. No, no, I'm, I'm both. Some, I'm, I'm know, both. I know you I'm a bit of both. But the the world we live in now, with people that are quite happy to just have Spotify, mm. to have ones and noughts, or to stream it, okay, for me it's like this is just that's sacrilege. Yeah. But of course, in one respect. It's a great thing. It's that they've got no problem with acquiring. They're not. They're not worried about the cost of it. Mm. how much they pay for it, how rare it is, all of that shit, really. Um, They're actually just going, I enjoy this music, I'll listen to it. Which is in its own way quite a pure thing, because I enjoy it. And you can listen to it when you want, on demand. But for me, the collecting part has always been a part of it. So have I been a mad collector in anything else? I've got tendencies, but nowhere, nothing like music. My problem is, I think you... you, you, you (laughs) To have everything is to discover nothing. That's my issue with it. So I either download and pay for the download or listen to vinyl. The problem is a lot of the music I love is because I haven't been able to skip. And that's huge. Oh, I don't really like this track in the album, but I'm not going to move the needle because it, it's just going to scrape. And, and, all, and then four <laughs> listens down the line, that's not my favourite track in the album. That's what we're missing. That's the problem with... with uh Spotify and, and, and all of these things yeah you, you, the album is dead yeah. so this is the most listened so I'll listen to them again and that's not how you discover music no so yeah. f- for that reason I'm old school in that area but I, I quite like the fact that somebody could say to me well okay so you've got 40 
Johnny Adams 45s, mm. which uh, when I found out I liked Johnny Adams as a soul singer, I, I, I bought as much, you know, all these all these soul singers. They're not all good. And I bought them and half of them I haven't played. Yeah, how stupid, <laughs> how stupid am I? But, you know, but that, that's, but I've got them. Yeah. Then one day I might play it. So there mm. you go. <laughs> okay, I'll let that, people will judge that comment. I don't have to say anything. I've got a clue. Right, I want to talk about the other thing. We mentioned obsession and domination. Um, for you, eight World Championship finals in nine years. I'm talking about the 80s. Won six world titles and held the number one ranking for seven consecutive seasons. So, Formula One had Senna and Prost. Football was Liverpool. You hang your can and squash. Won absolutely everything. For the large part, Daley Thompson and Ed Moses. Ed Moses won 107 consecutive finals. That's phenomenal in the 400 metres hurdles. Navaratilova at Wimbledon, big in my list, six in a row she managed. Maybe Magic Johnson in the uh, as well in the, in the basketball. While they were at the same time achieving the levels of domination that you were, did that automatically make them your heroes? Because you could look at them and see you knew what it took to do that. Um, I mean, I was aware of all, all of these people, but I don't think I was that interested. You were bigger than them. Snooker was so big in the 80s. You were bigger than Ed well, Moses. You were definitely bigger than Johan Geer Khan. You weren't as big as Liverpool. Don't be silly. Um, probably in Britain, you were bigger than Magic Johnson. Martina Avratlova, probably similar. Yeah, but only in the UK, of which we thought was the known world. Yes. I mean, I was world champion of effectively the known world, which was, you know, it's a bit like sort of everybody thinks that, that the UK is brilliant. And the only people who actually think it's brilliant are the people who never travel abroad, right, <laughs> to realise how great Europe is and what have we done, right? So, so at the time, I was world champion of the UK. That's how I felt. Yeah. I didn't really think it of any. I didn't. Wow. That's well. But you, did you not? The known oh, world. Was no, the, but you, did you not beat the record of well, three different nationalities in a row and world finals or something? Well, look, we and we've had loads of overseas players, but not not. It's 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 only just started to grow, to become a proper worldwide game. So, and I and I don't. I'm not doing myself down here. I, I couldn't beat anybody I didn't know. I beat everybody in the eighties that was a player. Yeah. And there was nobody hiding in in China or Africa back in you know that's, that's never come out. Or, you know, and, and the same thing applies. Yeah, you know, the best skier in the world may be living in Jamaica, never ever seen a ski slope. Yes. So, Opportunity. Yeah. So everybody who had the chance to play snooker and, and was you know in that in that I was playing against. I beat everybody, mm. but I still sort of went. Yeah, I'm. I'm but it, it's only a part, you know. And what happens if there's a? You can imagine if there was a a planet in the universe where everybody was brilliant and it was just a done deal that you could knock every ball in and it's no big deal at all it's just one little knack that you have for knocking a ball in or running very fast yeah. i've never really considered it that that much of a a massive thing but of course you get caught up in it all mm. and you become center of so you get caught up, yeah. yeah. You you can't help but like the fact that you're centre of attention. Did it ever turn you into to an asshole at any stage? There's no record of no, assholiness. No. There's not a lot of us. <laughs> no, there's not a lot. I, I think there are apparently, and I do apologise to Phil Collins. I, I ignored him once, oh. and I really do. I really, uh, and I only found out about it because we did a. There was a book written by somebody who knew him, who wrote a book on snooker, and he sort of mentioned it to me. Says that Phil Collins did thinks you you're an asshole, did and I was really, I was, I was so upset. But I mean, and I'm sure I have been an asshole. You know, you, you can't help but be, and sometimes you don't even know you've done it. Yeah. But generally, I've been quite aware of trying to make sure people didn't think I was that. But did, was it because did you feel like he ruined Genesis? Was that <laughs> no, part of it? Because I know that would have been obviously for you as a progger, you wouldn't have liked that, and you know, maybe <laughs> maybe he was snobby about his music. No, not at all. I didn't know I'd met him. I don't no. think I'd even... I, I think what happened was, it, it was something along the... I, That's worse. You were like, and, I you, know, and you are? I didn't even... No, I didn't even look. I think I'd look... I just looked down and scribbled an autograph. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. I still no. don't know the whole story. So I, I don't even know if I can trace it back to a point. But sometimes, say you come... Say you're in an area, right, sort of, and there's a load of people come towards you. They go, can I have an autograph? Yeah, you're like, okay, so you sign... Because back in the eighties, we were a little bit more pop starish yes. than the players are today. Everything's more calmed down now. But there was a time in the eighties; it was just stupid. Yeah. So you come downstairs in a into the hotel reception, 
of a, of a hotel you've been staying in, and there'd be a few people hanging around because they knew the snooker players were there. Or, so like, be, can I have autograph? Got autograph? No photos, no no selfies. Yeah. Nobody had a nobody. Had a, so you sign in, sign in. Yeah, thanks, th- thanks, thanks. Not looking up, just basically doing bosh, 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 and the, apparently I didn't acknowledge mm. the mm. fact that. I, but they, but it's maybe absolute rubbish because the person who told me by by being giving me a load of old madam, but if I if I have upset Phil, I really up, yeah. I'm upset that I've upset him. Apparently he said after that <laughs> because cause you didn't look up. He said you know all he had to do was was take a look at me now. Oh no, hey. no, I was. Yeah, I just, um, is it better for one person? Because I struggle with the answer to this. I hate when one person dominates and people say the same oh, thing know. every time. Don't, don't the say sport it. can't move on. What if they're not there anymore? Oh. As sure as night follows day, there's always somebody else. There was somebody, there was Hendry after you, and there was Higgins, Williams, and Ronnie after Hendry, and there will be someone after Ronnie. There was. There was the tennis player after the tennis player. There always is, right? No one is bigger in sport. But is it better... Does sport benefit from a dominating force or is sport better like now with snooker where we don't know he's going to win any tournament because Ronnie is picking and choosing a bit? The words that used to stick in my brain and me and my father used to hate it when it was said was when the dominating force, which was me back then and then Stephen Henry, lost, everybody came out and said, it's good for the game. I was like... (laughs) I want, to, I want to rip their throat out. You don't understand. It's nothing to do with that. It's not good for the game. It, you might like it, and that's acceptable because everybody likes the underdog to win. Yes. But actually, sometimes it's good to have a dominating force. They will lose occasionally. What, what, but like, you know, Tiger like Star Wars. Wars without Darth Vader. So, right. so you, you need... You can't need, have eight underdogs. No, no, you can't. And there is a problem... In something where you don't even you don't even know who's going to win, who's going to lose. You know, there's so many different winners of a golf event. You you really could become. It could get to the stage if the game becomes so popular, any sport becomes so popular, that the the ceiling of human endeavour is mm. reached, and you've got a hundred people that are all roughly the same. Yeah. Therein lies a problem. It's you know it's in a way there was something nice about the eighties in snooker that was very similar to say. WWF wrestling because you saw the same people all the yes. time so now we're getting to the stage in snooker where there's a lot more unknown players getting further through is that a turn off for the public watching maybe so because and the other thing happens is people stop watching as much because there's so much more entertainment out there they go oh I don't watch anymore because there's no characters in the game well you're not going to know what characters are in if you're not watching it so I don't watch much tennis anymore I don't watch a lot of cricket anymore. I don't watch a lot of football anymore. I don't even know plays for football, Manchester United or Liverpool. I don't. Sorry about this. I do apologize. No, it's no problem. I, I couldn't. I couldn't name one player. I know you're anti-football. You're a Charlton Athletic fan. No, I'm only anti-football because they they <laughs> they fall over fresh air. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, they do. Um, so, what happens when you don't even know one player of the top ten? Yeah. Then you're not going to watch even more. No. So, therein lies a problem of of not just getting somebody to watch it but retaining their interest that might be a problem I just think you need anti-heroes and heroes and as long as it's got that Snooker's actually maintained retained more of its character than say football has because of the media training and the lack of any decent answer in an interview there are loads of people give you good interviews in Snooker I just think people are set in their minds now that well if it's not Jimmy White having a drink and Steve Davis being straight and Ray Reardon making a joke and Cliff Thorburn's moustache. It's nostalgia at its worst. It's nostalgia at its worst. But, but, <laughs> just take that out. Um, we're not living in new countries that are watching. Yeah. We're, we're spoiled by the past. Yes. We're not the best people to judge it now, in a way. I think, you know, ask the fans in China who are the characters. Ask the people in Germany and Eurosport and across countries that have up until recently have never liked the game at all um and we're getting new following everywhere they're the ones that that they're they've got they've got no nost- they don't know they haven't got mm-hmm. a clue they, they might see on youtube they don't know who john spencer was they don't know yeah. terry griffiths cliff thorben they don't even know alex higgins mm. let, let me read this out and i'm gonna ask you a question at the end and i want an honest answer to it mm. 
Davis won a total of 28 ranking events, placing him fourth in the all-time list. In addition to his six world titles, he won the Masters three times and the UK Championship six times for a total of 15 Triple Crown titles behind only Ronnie O'Sullivan and Stephen Hendry. Question is, do you think you get the credit you deserve for what you actually achieved? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I feel so. Um, do you? Yeah, I, th- I think in some ways I probably get more credit. Than really? I, well, I'm not sure about that. I think players that want a hell of a lot less than you are held up as the spirit and the heart of the game. Oh, what you mean, yeah, Jimmy and, and Ronnie and Alex? Well, but I fully understand why that's the case. But I don't think, I, th- I think the, the general level of credit you know, for being a winning machine and, and has been wonderful. And I, and I get criticised by some people for saying this, but, and I, it's, there's no disrespect, hopefully they don't take it that way, to the general standard of play in the 80s. Stephen Hendry disagrees. I think the standard's forever improved. Mm. So I won, all, I won when the standard wasn't that great. The standard now is amazing, right? It, it was great, but it wasn't that great. Not by today's standard. So Ronnie O'Sullivan's five world championships and all of the type of things he's won, I think, are harder won than mine. So, it's not the same for any I, sport, well, is, though. So all sports are faster and slicker and more professional. Is that not the same as going? Um, well, uh, not to bring it to different issue, but oh, everybody in the seventies was a lot more bigoted. And you go, well, well, hold on a second. It was a different world. And while there were some horribly bigoted people, a lot of people were just a victim of the time, I suppose. We weren't as educated. And the internet's a huge part of that. But is it not just that we live longer and we're faster? Yes, you're right, yeah. But you can't really pin that on you. Evolution's not something we can blame Steve Davis for. I'll have a go if you want. Yeah, thank you. Uh, (laughs) Okay, so... uh, Perhaps I'm getting around to the... OK, let's say all of the great champions of snooker were all born at the same time. Mm. I don't know where I'd be in that bunch. I haven't got a clue. And and you, nobody will ever know. But, but Is Joe Davis still allowed to fix finals? Like, is he still allowed to stop playing because he's losing and come back the next day? Because if that's true, he's winning. I'm not sure that ever happened. I don't he did. know. did. He, he stopped a really? final way back in the day when it was up to, like, 68 he? frames or something. And he's I'm losing. I'll take the day off and came back and won. Well, back then, I've got a feeling that they were mainly trying to make money from selling the gate. Yeah. So I don't know what it was like back then. Yeah. There was no. There's no way they'd have had a best of 174, five, unless they were trying to do a week's worth of play to sell money on the gate to make a few quid because there was no money in the game. So uh, things have changed a little bit since. Then. So perhaps he went. Look, the scores were a bit lopsided. Let's have a review of whether we can make money if this tournament finished. I don't know. Who, who, God knows why. But I just don't think it matters. <laughs> uh, so you've answered that question for me in probably a more telling way than than you think when people listen back. Um, take me to Plumstead. Where did you go? So you're born. Where are you going? Where are you going in your childhood? Where are you walking to when you walk out your front door? Record store, snooker yeah, hall. Yeah. Uh, at some stage, realising that I I liked playing snooker and going up to the local working men's club with my father at weekends and, and fell in love with the game. And at the same time, roughly, was subjected to, as everybody was, to prog rock, because yeah. that was around then. That was the big scene back then uh, at that time. Virgin Records just started up. And when I got to sort of 16, 17, I was going to concerts mm-hmm. up in London Um Going to school and going to practice snooker, and that was my life. I, I was I was living and breathing snooker, but my musical tastes weren't normal. Okay, so you know why they're doing it. You're betting a game of football over three goals or under three goals. I'm gonna do over three friends or under three friends. Your proper friends, because I know what it was like at school, growing up in our eras where you like music that was different, that marginalised you straight away. Add on top of that, you're not playing football, marginalised straight away. So I'm going to go, real friends, like the, when you were 12, that you go to gigs with, etc. You know, you could listen to music with. Two. I'm going to go two. Sort of, you know, you've doubled it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not counting you. No. Right, okay. I, 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 had, a, I had maybe like two or three other, but there was one, me and one other guy, Neil Rogers. Yeah. We were the weirdos. We were the ones that really were pushing it out there, listening to Beefheart, Zappa, 
I don't know, not gentle giant because they were quite a British band, but seeking out weird, you know, Henry Cow things, seeking out weird music. Nobody else was, you know, everybody else was playing it safe. So, yeah, uh, one one's good. And, and if it wasn't for him, um, my my musical taste wouldn't have gone in this, exactly the same way because. It was a joint thing. You were both seeking yeah. stuff out. So I'd, I'd have never been aware of Captain Beefheart if it wasn't for Neil Rogers, and he may never have been aware of Gentle Giant. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. But yeah. It's brilliant, though. It was different. <laughs> you would find these little alliances of people who like your but music. Then, but then at the same time, I had... Uh, so at school, uh, there was one schoolmate that you know, was, was, was always there, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I was going to a snooker club, working men's club. Mm-hmm. I was allowed in... A, a younger age than than I was wouldn't than you should be, yeah. but because my father played for the league team, yeah. and so he got some sort of dispensation. And as long as he was chaperoning me yeah. in the club, that was how Stayed it was. Stayed in the corner. Yeah. Stayed at yeah. that table. At that stage. Yeah. But, but I started to show an interest in the game, and then then all of a sudden I'm the best player in the club. But I then made loads of friends who were older than me. Right. Exactly. So you so grew up quick in the snuggle. In one respect, but I didn't grow up amongst my my own so i yeah like i wasn't sort of like going out when i was getting to 16 or 17 18 clubbing it or anything mm-hmm. that part of it so my childhood my teenage childhood was 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 nothing non-existent really. no so i yeah. was very naive in many ways but in other ways i was dealing with older people and watching how they reacted in a club environment and all of their their ups and downs and uh, the arguments they'd have and mm. uh, learning to drink responsibly was quite an interesting you know, and I, now I first started playing snooker I was I was drinking and playing uh, funnily enough it was quite, you know, been age. Oh, sort of 16 yeah. you know, get a lager and limes and things it was only sort of when I became professional I stopped drinking yeah. it's quite, I did it the other way around from some exactly. of the other players from most of the other ones <laughs> <laughs> did you know that was a conscious thought when you were playing did you notice a lot of the merriment going on and you thought, well, this is an edge. At professional level? Yeah. Did you notice, hold on, well, if they're going, I can see what they're doing, so I won't do that, and that gives me 5%. Um, no, no, not at all. No, Jimmy's case, 58%. I, I, don't think, I don't think I was very, I was really aware of any of the snooker players' um, quantity. You know, you'd see some players ha- would have a drink at the table, but it wasn't always easy to know how many they'd had. I do remember losing once to a guy in Wales, a Welsh player... Anyway, he beat me drunk because yeah. I could smell it. So I think he might but, not have been drunk. Oh, now, now I'm now I've been upset. I've now I've been an asshole to somebody. Listen, you've already upset Phil Collins. Um, I, I like the fact you used to pack meat out the back of a supermarket, and I know you discovered music from that as well. Alan Freeman on the yeah, radio, yeah. and yeah, I know that was where you discovered quite a lot of the music that you mentioned, Gentle Giant, and that was all coming from Alan Freeman, and well, where radio stations has had a bit more freedom as well. Yeah, well, I think that yeah, obviously, you know, John Peel gets loads of credit for that, but Alan Freeman at one stage was doing a pretty decent radio show on a Saturday afternoon, and when we were out the back of the supermarket pre-packing meat and stamping the prices on and things um that show was quite out there i feel it, amazing to think that back now yeah. but you know, six music's probably taken over that mantle now if yeah. you, you you'll probably be able to listen to a lot of decent stuff via that way or phoenix fm yeah of course yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But, well things have changed quite dramatically in as much as we've done that for a long time i haven't we've stopped it for the moment radio play is is an interesting thing as a music fan you do it i don't know how how long you can do it for but we we had a good run at it me and a friend of mine uh and in the end i don't know it's a a struggle i mean you do i don't know if you're around how you it's about the people who listen so if you feel if you feel like you're hitting the same people all the time then it becomes less of a thing it's about sharing the the tune and why it connects with your heart that that's what it is sounds cheesy but that's what it is it's connecting with people through music so it's very hard to do anything for more than 10 years but i love the fact that people will get on to it in a bit i don't want to skip ahead people you didn't just all of a sudden decide you were going to go out and dj and you were going to play glastonbury you were doing the radio show for ages and nobody cared nobody meant not a single column inch for about six years you were going on a rainy day once a week to that studio yeah i know yeah yeah community radio yeah Yeah. brentford and maybe a few other houses yeah well it was it was uh (laughs) and and it was good i mean we had a chat room and it's slowly the chat room built up and it was great and that's the key and and like i really used to enjoy like you know finding new music and playing it It was a real good buzz Mm. Mm. um and then all of a sudden after retiring from snooker just by a total accident 
we started DJing. It, yeah. it, was, it was total accident. Yeah. But the, the years I did the radio show, great memories. Um, funny enough, we'll get on the music now, but one more question and just a, just an overall umbrella question because you can talk about for as little as much as you want. But your father, Bill, was massive, wasn't he? From the day you were born to the day he passed away. Jeez, everything oh. I read about you. Well, if it wasn't for his, his enthusiasm, I could have never have really got the start, mm. let alone the continuation of support. So I could have been a darts player because my father used to play darts for the club, pub team, and he got dartitis and he couldn't let go of the last dart. Mm. He'd fallen over. He tried playing left-handed. People don't people don't look as good playing left hand as Ronnie O'Sullivan does playing left. Yeah. You don't get many ambidextrous <laughs> darts players. They sort of there's not the same throw with yeah. your left hand. Um, so he, he tried to play. He tried to play left. Yeah, you know, this was back in the fifties, perhaps, yeah. right? Um, he couldn't play. Gave up darts because it was driving him mad. Sports psychology was in its infancy back in in Plumstead in that. Area. So he took up snooker, and then he tried to improve himself at snooker. Somewhere down the line, I came along and showed interest. He, he, he then used the, the technical book by Joe Davis to try and teach me. But, of course, I had what it took. And so then we went on a journey together. Can you imagine what it must be like? Like, if you've got your son becomes good at something, yeah. and, you, and like you, you're in, not living your life through it. It's not wasn't like that. But the excitement of what happened, to think, bloody hell, my, my boy's bloody good. Yeah. And I tried, and and then becoming the coach, the overseer of it all, and then all the journeys around the country, going up and down the motorways across London before the M25 was, all of those journeys, as well as doing a job six o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night working for London Transport, mm. but living the life of snooker and thinking, you know, every day not enjoying the job, but thinking, right, tonight we're going to do, a, we're playing a match in the local league. Yeah and enjoying the process of following that and then being there at the World Championship and all through the career being the coach yeah. but also the, 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 the dad. Correct. Well, yeah, but, but my, both my parents as well, they both supported me. Yeah. But obviously my father, when I, when I was coming of age, supported the fact that I didn't go and get a job that they looked after me that wouldn't have been everybody's that wouldn't have been every parents and doing a job yeah. like a real job I remember Pat Nevin telling me off air so I hope you don't mind me saying um, he told me a good story about his dad hardly ever missed a game he played in and I said that must be nice to see him every week and he said well I hardly saw him I was like why and he went well you used to have to leave 10 minutes before the end to get the train back to Scotland To he worked on the trains I think so he used to get to travel so he could make his night shift uh, and I said so he would come and you wouldn't see him he says well I knew he was there and he says I do a mazy dribble at the start of the first half until I lost the ball which was my I love you dad like that's some story yeah. isn't it but like yeah it, it absolutely is it's, it's all of that and I hear it a lot but it's yeah. no less special when I hear it yeah well we, we, had, we had our defined roles as well he knew that he didn't know that much about the playing side of it mm -hmm. but he, he could spot the technique so we had a sort of but we still had massive arguments you know mm -hmm. about how to improve and all of that but working with your your dad every day on the practice table it, it's quite an amazing thing to do because most people once they get to a certain age don't want to be anywhere near their parents yeah. but I was all for, for a long period of time and so when he passed away it was like um well my reason for playing is gone yeah so part of the team's gone and um, and it, it was quite quick. So I played in the World Championship in 2016, and he passed away uh, you know, prior to that. Yeah. I played, I thought, I'll, I'll play in this. Um, and there was one moment I was practising in the build-up to it and struggling, because I've been, you know, you struggle for ages, and I was not really enjoying playing. I was playing more for him, I think, in the end, for the last two or three years. I should have retired before that, but I didn't want to, because he was still watching on the television when he wasn't, wasn't too well. Mm. And I remember he passed away, and I remember practising, and um, all of a sudden I thought, oh, if I, if I move my cue onto my chest and I started practising and started playing really well, I thought, oh, shit, I'll, I'll tell him. Mm. I thought, oh, yeah, shit. Yeah. So that was like, and, and then when I retired, it was obviously the emotion of retiring and everything, mm -hmm. but it was a massive relief. Yes. It was just such a weight off my shoulders yeah. because I wasn't enjoying playing at all. I just hated it. Not because I don't like the game, 
as you go, as you know, people say, what what is it about getting old? Is it your eyes are go? It's not. You, your whole body doesn't like the process as much. You don't like the tension. You're you're as an older person, you don't deal with the tension as well. Mm. It's not about bottle. It's just your body can't react like it used to. Mm. It's not built for the fight as well. The, the recovery from the adrenaline yeah. release, yeah. everything doubles, triples, quadruples. Yeah. So then, all of a sudden, when I retire, it's like, oh, great! I don't have to play. Mm. Slightly different for Stephen Henry, retired further up the ladder than me. I don't know how he feels about it. Be, I don't care, I'm not interviewing him. Um, <laughs> so what, let's stick with snooker then, because I was, wasn't going to, but that's fine. Maybe we can have a whole chunk of music and other things. So I'm not interested in chronicling your entire career. No, that's not, not going to work, yeah. right? No, you. I'm just going to pick up a couple of matches that I just love little things about. So the 147 that you made, which was um, the first televised maximum break, at, it was at the Classic in the Queen Elizabeth Hall. Lard, um, you won a ladder. Lard yeah, you, but you won a ladder. No, I just wanted, for people that don't realise the problem with that, is if your family bought a ladder in the 80s, you were ostracised from the entire community. How do you double the price of a ladder? Fill the petrol tank. How do you make a policeman laugh? Tell him your ladder just got stolen. It's literally the worst prize you could ever get. At the time of winning that, I had a Porsche. <laughs> So, what do you say? Well, I mean, like, I, I sort of like <laughs> this. The story. I mean, I sort of. You know, this is not giving a game away. You sort of do it after dinner speaking. Yeah. It's a good story. Isn't it? So this is the truth, right? So at the time, it was in 1982. I was 25. I think yeah, 25. Um, sports person, male. Okay. The insurance on my Porsche was 2,500 quid a, 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 a year. Yeah. Wow. Okay. A Lada car retailed at two thousand four hundred and ninety nine, <laughs> and uh, but uh, obviously I had to have a photograph, publicity photograph taken oh, with it. You know, wow. uh, but I was delighted to. Yes. I made the first one four seven break on television, so I was delighted to have a photograph with the Lada. And they'd sponsored a snooker event, so I was supporting Lada. You know, it wasn't sort of, it wasn't that embarrassing. And and the thing was, at the time, my parents didn't really have a car that was. It wasn't not they didn't have a car was roadworthy, but their car was wearing out. The one that had been travelling, I've been travelling up and down the motorways, even father driving, brand new car. Yeah. So my parents drove it. Were they okay with that? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, my mum struggled to go around corners because because there was no powered steering, right? <laughs> and there was a proper there was a proper choke. You pulled it out, and you could see the wire underneath. But on occasions, when you know my Porsche was getting mended, or I didn't, you know, I'd, just, I'd jump in it and drive, right. and it was like a tank. It never went wrong. It was like built like an absolute tank. Trouble is, you, you couldn't turn around corner. You could three point turn. You have to do a bodybuilding course, yeah. <laughs> but it worked. It worked all the time. And then the following year, because of the publicity, I think that Lada cars got the Yugo, the Yugoslavian version of the Lada car. Yeah. They sponsored an event, and of course, you know, the, I don't think any player even wanted to go near pot in a black <laughs> off a spot just in case they, they fluked to 147 yeah um the masters in 1996 97 right you hadn't won a triple crown title in ages oh. hendry taken over at this stage you'd say do you know what i mean he was the man to beat yeah. and you were eight four down against ronnie o'sullivan and you won 10 eight given that at that stage you're thinking there's less of these to come or this might be the last i've picked that one out as maybe being right near the top of your list I think so. Yeah, I mean, the things you remember, I, I don't remember much about winning mm. tournaments. I, I remember that one. That was like, I was one of my proudest ever moments. Were you, were you uh, I'm not going to say like assaulted or anything, right? But wasn't that the, was that the one at the Wembley Conference Centre where the crowd was very football-esque? Like, did you take a wee bit of stick at that? I don't remember. I mean, the, the, the crowds that used to go to watch Alex Higgins, Jimmy White and Ronnie O'Sullivan have over the years pulled in different types of people than would normally watch. Mm -hmm. So the crowds have always been more vociferous than when those players have been playing. So some of the, you know, some of the crowds that came to watch me and versus Alex, mm. even at Wembley, were you know, yeah, it could get quite quite nasty. Because people in Northern Ireland genuinely had the god and the devil. Like I remember the seven nil, you know, when, when you were seven up and. People were celebrating that in the streets when he came back. Like, genuinely, I mean, hate's a strong one. I'm not going to say they hated you because they didn't, but the armchair hated you in Northern Ireland. Like, you were everything they didn't want to win, and Alex was everything we did. Yeah. Like, I, I wasn't quite at that point. I was t would have been too young. But, but like, 
that that rivalry was like you were seen absolutely yeah. as the enemy by people from Northern Ireland. Yeah, but, but I mean, it wasn't like yeah, you know, I was a London-based player, but yeah. still, Alex would have more support in London when, when we wow. played in the in the in the, in the Masters, and, like, and Jimmy the same. Yeah, I mean, but everybody, you know, but I. I understood that. I didn't know that, but a slightly different crowd came along. I don't remember playing the final against Ronnie and it being massively one-sided because, funnily enough, by then I'd started to come out of that. Not that it's the dark tunnel, but I'd now been seen in a different light. That I was somebody who kept on losing to Stephen Hendry, right. and I was past my best, you know, so to speak. You so become the underdog almost. And if you're the underdog, you get a few more people start rooting for you. So mm. whilst I, I think probably still people love watching Ronnie O'Sullivan mm. play, he may have felt the heat from me being the underdog for the first, one of the first times. But I was not expected to beat him at all. Um. Uh, streaker yeah that had a streaker in it so another reason to pull it out never happened had it cost me a fortune fortune to hire her no it didn't (laughs) yeah I I, I do remember um, the moment she I don't remember I didn't see her I didn't even see her face right I've seen her face since but but I didn't see her what happened was as I walked back after missing a shot I walked back to my chair. I was three one down. I think, or might be four one down. Things were going just wrong, and I and I was I was all over the place. I felt something happening out of the corner of my eye as I walked back to my chair, and I thought, and the crowd reaction. I knew it was a streaker. Yeah, I knew it was something. So she's jumped over the panel, and now she's bouncing around, and 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 I refused to look. But then the greatest moment was when Ronnie O'Sullivan came to the table and wiped the brow of John Street. What a, what a class thing for <laughs> Ronnie to do. And we all laughed. You know, it, did, did she come out, though, as a huge Steve Davis fan, didn't she, after that? Really? The, the story was that yeah. she, it was you she was gunning for, not no, this young, no. handsome Ronnie O'Sullivan. She was looking experienced. Well, you know, you just never know, do you? But I, <laughs> I just remember thinking, well... It, it, it broke the ice for me because I was under so much. It was like a, a funny moment that mm. happened. And then I sort of got back into it. But even so, in the evening, I, I think I got back to four all over for the first session. But then Ronnie just like blasted me off the table eight four. Mm. I've got no way of winning. Mm. And then that, so my proudest moment was winning from eight four behind and beating Ronnie. And I know that Ronnie overall ever because that's when I picked yeah. out. I well, had a bit of a get. I, I, I thought I'd have one. a stab at that. I got. An, I, got I think another one's John Higgins in the World Championship. The quarterfinal. Uh, the second, r- second round. Yeah. So this is 20, I want to say 10, 12? Yeah, something like that, yeah. That, that is one of my proudest, proudest moments. Is that because that was it? Like, is that, was that where you were at in your head? Is like, did it, I don't know. It's easy to reply uh, uh, hindsight and I don't want to do that. So you, so you suppose you can tell me why? Because you sunk to your knees when you won that. Well, I think... Um, the longer you go without being the dominant force, the longer you are struggling for form, you're struggling for confidence, and you're starting to accept your lot. You, you, you don't want to, but you, 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 somewhere down the line, you have to say, well, I'm never going to win anything. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm, you know, even though you may not say it to the press, mm. inside, no. you, 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 you just know, have I, got, have I still got anything in the tank? Can I pop the pressure balls when required? I keep on missing them. I keep on bottling it. You know, I never used to bottle it, now I'm bottling it. Mm. Uh, yeah, so then all of a sudden, when all of a sudden you get a result, like beating Ronnie, but it, but more so because it's further down the line, beating um, John Higgins. When when he was world champion, he was favourite. I'm not supposed to have a chance. I've done well to get through my first round match. Yeah. Um, and then to beat him and, and actually clinch the match, what a buzz. And then it was like, um, I think it was like the, you know, sort of like the, the over, was it a 50 year old? You're the, old, you're the oldest person to win a match. I, I don't know if it's still the record. It, it might still be. I think Nigel Bond. I don't know, Nigel Bond might Possibly, I didn't, but, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. But even so, to beat the world champion. And then John Higgins said the, lo- the loveliest thing to me as we sort of shook hands. He said, you're still the master. Oh. What, what a class thing to say. What a line. What a class thing to say, yeah. Oh. And then the, sh- the shit hit the fan after that. But that was yeah. another story. Different story, that. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm gonna finish with this in terms of the snooker. Uh, I wrote down the '89 Grand Prix final, 10 nil whitewash. The domination is what we haven't talked about. Second Masters title against Mike Hallett in '88, nine nil. And of course that match you played against Dennis Taylor in 1985. Of course I'm talking about the Grand Prix when you <laughs> set the record for the longest one day final in snooker history to beat him in a deciding frame 10 9. Funny how it doesn't get mentioned as much, but I think the 89 World Championship, you'd done Hendry 
in the semis and the performance against John Parrott described as the greatest display of potting, break building and safety player ever seen. Well, at the time, I, I, I do f- Did remember. you know that? No, I wasn't aware that was... Who no, said that? that is, it, it, <laughs> the Guinness Book of Snooker. Oh, well, that must be true then. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty... Like, objectively, people say that is flawless. Did you walk off thinking, how the hell have I done that? Or did it feel as big a struggle as, as anyone? No, do you know, I, I, felt, I, I felt like I was... Uh, I, I had a false field around me. Mm. Can I, I give you an analogy that I think you'll love? Or, a, or you know, a comparison. Jonathan Edwards interviewed once. And I said, how do you know it's a good triple jump? And he said, when it's wrong, it hurts every bone in my body. And when it's right, I can't even feel myself touch the ground. And that's all we stuck with me. And Ronnie's told me and Jimmy's told me, this game, when it works, feels like the easiest game in the world. Yeah, yeah. You're just trying to capture that in a bottle with, with Snooker. Well, I mean, the hardest thing to do is to go behind in a frame and clear up. Mm. But I seem to remember, whether I did it a lot, but I seem to remember it was no problem whatsoever. And every every time I went behind in a frame, I just mopped up the balls and basically just punished every mistake. That's how I feel. I don't know. I've not watched it. I've never watched the match back. Never? No, no. I, I mean, do you like it if it comes on, you're doing the BBC coverage and they show a thing? Not really. Do you go, it's a little treat, or do you look the other way? No, nah, I don't really like watching it. I've, I've seen, unfortunately, the last frame of the, of the, of the, of the final that, that we're not talking yeah. about. Um, and I should have perhaps watched games, you know. And people have said, you know, you keep on saying you're not as, you're not as good as today's players. You should watch yourself. And I go, mm. I don't believe that anyway. But, but I'm not going to waste my time on the planet watching old footage so that's one of the reasons I mean you know I, I, I prefer to watch a film or listen it's to a something. mindset yeah right. so unless I was you if I was watching for for technical you know to try and improve my technique but yeah but you take loads of pictures are you a picture person is your phone full of everything you do no right okay so you have that existential outlook I have it I'll record this at home. I have to listen back to the final version. I have to. I don't enjoy me no, in it. No, no. And I tell Phil, who's helping edit in this series, Phil, take as much of me out as you can. And I'll listen through once. And I have never listened back to an episode of this that I'm going to have to. It's what's next. So I suppose it's a it's a mindset thing. I, I feel I feel like it's... Um it's all about the next thing. There's a there's a film that, that resonated with me by, uh, that's got Richard Dreyfuss in called Whose Life Is It Anyway? Yeah. It's not a massively well-known film. He's got quite an easy role in it. After five minutes, he's he's in a bed yeah. and he's, he's totally paralysed. He gets run over in a lorry crash or something. And he was, a, he was an artist. He was a sculptor. And then he, he wants them to turn off the machines. Um, but they're they're saying you, we we're not allowing you to turn off the machine. So it's, it's all about the court case. That then it's quite amazing, quite a deep, you know, hard film. But there's a moment here where a, a woman comes in to try and talk him around and say, "Well, you could teach." And he said, well, "That's not what I do, did it for. I did it for the doing of it." And it, that resonated with me. It's the doing of it. Yeah. That's the buzz. Yeah. The the records, they're irrelevant. They're totally. Yeah, perhaps it's proof you're doing it right. But it's about the next one. It's about the, the, the time you're doing it. And for me, at my even more worst moments in my life, the snooker table has been a sanctuary of being able to take my brain out of gear. I don't struggle in that department. You know, I'm fortunate that lots of people in sport do. But the actual doing of it is the best therapy you could possibly have. So the problem lies for a lot of sports people when they pack up that they've got a massive void. So when you get the chance to play for as long as you can, I think you should grasp it, and snooker players can. But when you stop the doing of it, it's so good. So you had to, the, as you say, the relief of leaving snooker behind, and you, you don't call it the second career. And I agree with you, music isn't a second career for you, but it's the second chapter. It's the second huge chapter because you love so much. So you sit here now as a recording artist. So you can people can be as novelty as much as they call it snooker star DJ or whatever they want to call. But you have hanging out of your coat pocket over there, Utopia Strong's first record. You're in the studio right now making a second record. You play live on stage and you DJ with, with uh, Kavis Tarabi. You are that. Forget Steve Davis. You just are now a recording artist. 
that is quite a strange thing to to actually come to terms with. And it's I, easy to joke in it about it, but we shouldn't. Totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm still pinching myself that something weird has happened. I, I feel very blessed that I've been fortunate enough to for this to happen. Um, I don't. I, I'm not trying to judge it by my obsession with snooker. That was a crazy obsession. I don't think I'm anywhere near the level of somebody who's practiced playing guitar or practiced playing the piano, that level of what's required. But I stumbled upon an instrument that can be played with no no perceived dexterity, which is a is a is a modular synthesizer. Which is used in loads of the music you've liked yes. your whole life. Yeah. So that tangerine dream we're doing it, yeah. but with no keyboard, just a telephone wire exchange, patching telephone exchange wires in, and music comes out of it. And so I've listened to music all my life, so I, I know what I think is a good record, and I know what's a bad one. And I bumped into Carver Tarabi and Mike York, and we we got on so well. We started making some music. I was like, these two guys are musicians, mm-hmm. and I'm sitting there with my my newfound hobby, twiddling, trying to make some noises. But we started to make some stuff and we listened back and it was like, bloody hell, this, this could be made into something. We could make a record. Now, and it's just, gone, it's just gone stupid. So then the next thing is we finally make a record. We give it to some people we knew called Rocket Recordings, a proper record label. And they say, yeah, we like it. We like it in spite of the fact that you're in it. Because right. I'm a lot of liability. Yeah, they don't not, want a novelty record. They don't want yeah. a novelty. The next minute they go, yeah, we're going we're to go with it. But you are going to do live performances, aren't you? Well, I, I mean, like, I, I went cold. I said, what? But in the spirit of saying yes rather than saying no, I've thrown myself into the deep end and I've been on the stage with a musical instrument playing with two other guys and our first gig was at Glastonbury. Yes. I mean, I, I do appreciate the fact that perhaps we're off to a running start because the novelty does work. We've yeah. got a bit more publicity than we should have done, maybe, because yeah. the novelty's worked. But it can only last for us. It's got to be good. In yeah. We've got good reviews. So we're That's bloody. the key. That's the two things. So I watched the video back of the Glastonbury performance. People turn up dressed as you, as Dennis Taylor, as like Q's full outfit. But that's a Glastonbury thing. You're not going to that tent knowing that you're going to hear anything else than avant-garde music. So when you actually watch the crowd, the vast majority of them were actually going, impress us with what you're playing. And that happened and, yeah. and, and it had that, it just grew the buzz as I watched it and could just see people getting into it in whatever way they do at Glastonbury. And I could see it connect and then I could see you change and just relax and connect and forget that it's no one's looking you know what I mean? And yeah. and it was beautiful. I don't mean to be a glass and brie, I'll make cliche here, but it was spiritual. It was great. It was a full tent. But the reviews is the key. Yeah. And they were good of your first album. They were. Yeah. And there would have been a lot of people wanting to bury you. What was it like to go read a review in a, in a quality blog or music magazine or music website that was like four out of five? Just you amazing. Know? Just amazing. Utopia Strong, by the way, name of the band. Yeah. Um, it, it, listen, it's not for everybody. But it's not, um, it's not for many. No, no. But hardly for anybody, I'd say. Actually, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first week it came out, you like Phil Collins. If you like Cole, no, I'm going. The first week it came out with pre-sales, which help, mm-hmm. obviously. We got to number thirty-one in the independent UK album charts. Right. It, it was pinch me time, more so than even pinch me. I'm world snooker champion. I remember yeah. waking up. The morning of being world snooker champion of the known world, okay, going, I do not believe I'm the best player in the world. My God, I'm actually the best player in the world. The surreal shock of going, we've got an album out and people like it. That is weirder for yeah. me. Yeah. I can understand playing snooker. I, I play, knock the balls in and you win, mm. you, black and white. I don't think I, I've ever had a, an insecurity dream about snooker. Right about what you know, not being able to get the ball in the pocket not bending being, over no trousers yeah or not yeah. turning I can't find the venue I've not, I don't think I've ever yeah. had one of those right but I've had so many about not being able to get to the venue or opening oh the God. box up and the the, 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 the record's, record's not ready yeah or the, I've the, had that one many times yeah. when I was a music DJ yeah so I'm now thinking like there are certain buttons dials on a, a synthesizer you should never touch mm. that one can affect the, the frequency it's quite an important part apparently right mm. and I'm just living in fear that I touch these because you could accidentally brush one and it just ruins everything yeah. and I'm getting these dreams it's, like, it's just terrible I mean like yeah I don't know what to do have you started to try and play any other instruments no 
No, I, I mean, I used, to, I, I tried to, I didn't try very hard. I'm the equivalent of a, a sixteen break player at, no, perhaps an eight break yeah. at snooker, a piano, right. perhaps four break. I'm not stupid enough to think that I could, I could pick the piano out, and I don't think it, it's, it'll be harder to learn as you're older yeah. anyway. Yeah. But I've, I've got some, I found something that worked for me, and I can enjoy mm-hmm. making music with it on my own, and also in the band, it's great fun. You so you're supporting Steve Hillage, who's a legend of so many of your scene. But I'm just you know this is the thing, right? I look through the venues and it makes so much sense in terms of my old DJ days and stuff. But you go at the waterfront in Norwich, the old fruit market in Glasgow, the Junction in in Cambridge, Rock City in Nottingham, the Kentish Town Forum stage you're going to be on in in London in 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 October, the Ritz in Manchester. This is like. You're back in the dressing room. We're on the tour you bus. Know. We're on the Steve Village's tour bus. I mean, Steve Village is a legend. He's in. He was in Gong. He was in the first. He was yeah. in the massive part of Gong. Where and and all of a sudden, you know, by a, a sequence of events, we're their support band for a hero of mine when I was in my teens. Yeah. And I, I know him now, and and it's just um, I can't quite. Uh, I don't know what what would the equivalent be. I don't really what. Well, it'd be like if if you're a sports fan, all of a sudden you get to play in the same team because you all of a sudden find out you're good at a basketball. Next minute you're playing with Magic Johnson or something yeah, like that. Yeah. I mean, people are going to make an obvious connection here, right? They're going to say, "Well, he had the buzz of performing in snooker, mm-hmm. and he has naturally found his way to find a similar buzzer performance." Yeah, maybe. I don't see that. I don't find it there. I think this genuinely maybe. is. An obsession that existed when you were still playing snooker that just happened to click somewhere when you met somebody. I don't think you went, what's going to fill the void? No. I don't think no. you needed the acclaim of people when you were playing snooker, let alone now. I think you're so lucky to have avoided the drug of needing acceptance from people you don't know. It may be the adrenaline buzz is something that you you become a little bit of a junkie and, and all of a sudden... I wouldn't say I sort it out because I think do think sort of it's an accident in in some ways, but I can feel the same the the, th- the thrill of it all the same thing, but the actual making of the music of going into the studio or 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 of discussing what you've got to try and change it from what what it started out and add to it and take it bits away, that I quite f- found quite fascinating and interesting, mm-hmm. a bit like you know if you've got a radio show you're editing it. You can do whatever you want with it. You can, you can go in different directions. You can pick and choose. So that part I've really enjoyed. I do feel like I'm a totally different animal. I don't associate with my younger self. Mm. I, I don't know where it came from now. But I just f- feel quite lucky I've, I've stumbled upon something. Do, do you, does your cue ever come out now? Or does it come out when there's a few quid? Not being this in a rude way, of course. I'm just saying, does it come out when there's a few quid to be made? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, more so. I, I can't play for fun. I, 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 snooker exhibitions, I've never thought of as snooker anyway. No. Snooker exhibition is is an entertainment form where you're using snooker as the medium for entertaining. Great fun. Mm. I'm still doing exhibitions with Dennis Taylor. Great fun doing them. We did some theatre, some nostalgia days with John Verga, playing a bit of snooker. But that is one question that's been asked more of me than anything else is, do you still play for fun? And I, I can't play for fun. No. How can I? I think the reason is, I, I think, um, and I don't want to talk about Stephen Henry, but I'm going to, and I, and I don't want to sort of like spill any sort of, you know, chats, but I'm going to because it's an interesting point. I think because I played it for for long enough that I, I exercised all of my desire to play competitively. Mm-hmm. Stephen retired early. I still wonder if he should have carried on a bit longer. And Stephen's still practising and still trying to improve or still try to get back to a standard. And I was talking, I said, why are you, why are you doing that now? And he's got, it's like unfinished business. I was thinking, oh, well, yeah, I can understand it if you just did what you, because the game eats away at you trying to hit, hit the ball straight. Mm-hmm. And towards the end of Stephen's career, same as mine, we couldn't hit the ball straight. And he wants to try and find out why he can't hit the ball straight, mm. like why he's got a golfer's slice. But that's his obsession at the moment. Somewhere down the line, he'll go, yeah, I've, I've done that now. I'll, get, I'll, I'll, get, I'll move on. But he's currently still going. Place. Yeah, because he's younger than me now. So it's, he's, not, yeah. he's, no, he's no different to where I was 10 years ago. Um, Barry Hearn sat exactly here for this series. Complete coincidence. Two very different reasons to do the chat. 
and he's been there the whole way through and your friendship survived. I don't really want to get into that friendship. I just want to ask a simple question. Has he been to see you play live? Because I can't imagine Barry Hearn, right? <laughs> I'm just looking at the dates. Where, where could he make? Southampton, maybe, the 1865. He definitely would leave before Steve Hillage. I don't even think he would get there for Steve Davis. No, I've not invited him along to any gigs. I don't know. God knows. He's got, he's got the album. He says he likes track seven quite a lot, but, but well, he, he doesn't dislike track seven. I actually had a lovely, I had a lovely moment with um, with Barry uh, recently um, on his seventieth birthday. His, his family uh, organised a secret party where his favourite folk singer came over from from America called Tom Paxton oh. and played, and he didn't even know he was turning up, and he was like tears in his eyes. His favourite singer turned; it was in his back garden in a marquee. And all of a sudden, Eddie, Eddie Hearn said, uh, right, you thought you were full of surprises. Could have had a golf day in the day. He had, he had a day of surprises. You thought he'd finished the surprises. We got one more. And then the curtain went and, and he started singing all the songs. And he just sat at the front singing his heart out. He loved it. That, that was a marvellous moment. Amazing. But I don't think, I don't think, it's not his scene, really. If you're a true friend, you wouldn't actually inv- invite him along, I think. Because <laughs> you know, like, it's just not him he's at been, all. He's been... Uh, I, I can't quite believe how lucky it was that I bumped into him yeah. at that time because nobody knew where I was going. Mm. Nobody knew where Snooker was going and nobody knew what capabilities Barry Hearn had as a promoter mm. or a manager. So to bump into a, a good one back then... It was just like um, you know, a match made in heaven was amazing, and so we still we are still are today. Even though I don't play anymore, mm. we're still sort of still managed by the, still that's carrying on bizarrely. The other thing that an obsessive vocation does, uh, I'm being that list as, as well. I suppose I've always been obsessed about my job. Probably work way too much. Is it affects the family side? So I don't ask personal questions, but because you were married throughout that, and you're divorced now. You're two. You've got two two kids, two sons. Um, after snooker, and now you're in this a lot more of a level, balanced life. Do you, are you still trying to find that? Like, is that big in your list, or do you, do you uh, remain maybe a little bit of a lone wolf on that front? Um, that's not true. You don't ever have to ask, answer anything that I ask. It's just a genuine. It comes from a good place. That question. I I I, I tend to think that maybe you're blessed with certain skill sets, and you may not be so skillful in others. So, <laughs> Uh, but, so, yeah, I, I don't think I, I don't think I, I'm I don't think I'm a, a very good husband. A, a material, yeah. I don't know. You, you don't know. Perhaps it's because it's all it's you, 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 mm. it, it, or me, me, me. It's, it's all about, it, it, and you become so spoiled. You, you've had it too easy all your own way. Mm. Perhaps you haven't had to work at things, and you, and you just are spoiled beyond belief. That may be it. But it may also be that you're just not, that's not, you're not cut out for normality that seems to be normality. But I do actually think that given enough rope, Mm. more people would be, you know, relationship struggling Mm. if they had a a, a stranger lifestyle. So sometimes it may be a circumstance. It it may be that's the case. Mm. Right, random questions to finish. Uh, political changes? You think seeing it went from blue to red in a lot of things that have read? Or certainly, but it's interesting because most people as they get older, they say they turn more conservative, whereas you seem to have turned more liberal. Yeah, I, I, I think um, I definitely got sucked into the blue world back in the day. Um, probably the biggest mistake I did get involved in mixing that world, but I sort of learned my lessons. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't particularly bothered about it, but I still mm. pinned my flag somewhere. And I really don't have that much of a, an opinion of any of them these days. Mm. And I don't think a lot of people have, but if anything, I, I'm tending to want to go down the road of less economic growth and more happiness. And that's more red. Mm. And also... Yeah, maybe like m- more people looking after people, and it doesn't seem to me that the world we live in at the moment mm. is doing a very good job of looking after people. Uh, your favorite book is *The Many Coloured Land* mm. by Julian May. It's science fiction. <laughs> your music tastes are avant-garde and out there. Are you obsessed with science fiction as such, as in other life forms? 
is this some a secret thing you haven't talked about? Because I think you know, have you met an alien? Do you feel these type? I, I feel like there may be a little kink here where we could get a little bit David Ike. Don't think I've uh, <laughs> I've not met I've met I've met a few people that may have been alien. Uh, um, no, no, I, I definitely think there's out they're out there, but I don't think we've ever been visited by any. Right. Um, but but um, <laughs> see where I'm going now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, yeah well, I'm not that well read. But yeah. but science fiction books, I, I really did get into. Uh, the Melly Coloured Land series. It was the only book I've ever had of dreams and uh, nightmares about. It was the effect, it was quite a, it's quite an entertaining book. Yeah. But anyway, the idea, the concept of it. But I'm not that well read. I, I, I yeah, mm. it's not like I can't read. But I, I... Uh, you won Rear of the Year. Yeah, I won Rear of the Year. Was that just like? I suppose you bent over the table all the time, so everyone's seeing your bum all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I won Rear of the Year. Yeah, I've been like. Doing, I felt, I felt. I mean, in a way, you feel a bit used when you when you. Um, Sue Pollard from Heidi High was yeah. she was the female rear of the year uh, that year. Yeah. It was uh, awarded by Jeans Company. So at the time, everybody was jumping on the bandwagon for snooker. Mm. The snooker was getting used for loads of things. Mm. I won haircut of the year. No. Yeah, back in the eighties as well. And I had ginger hair. Uh, I had a part in. And some, a little bit of dandruff, and I still want haircut of the year because they just want the publicity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, like you know, know. What, you had a haircut for a while, looked like someone cracked an egg on it and oh, just right. pushed it over. Well, I, I had a bit of a wave; yeah. I couldn't get rid. Of. But I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think necessarily my ass was that. You know, yeah. it wouldn't have been in the same shape as uh, Daily Thompson's, would it? No. Better bomb. <laughs> Decathlete, you know, yeah. he's going to be. It was a great moment when um, we turned up at Wembley to play in the charity game before the cup final. And me and Dennis Taylor were on the same team, so it must have been probably the year after. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, Daley Thompson was on the other team, and uh, I was playing right wing. Um, Dennis Taylor was playing right back, so we're down the same side. And then all of a sudden, Daley Thompson got the ball, and he played amateur football. I think he played mm. semi-professional. He went past Dennis, just dribbled the ball past him. Dennis turned around and started running after him. And then I saw Dennis from a distance fall arse over tit, forward somersault, collapsed on the floor. And I asked him afterwards, he went, well, he said, I turned around and ran after him. He said, and after a couple of seconds, he thought, why am I running after Daley Thompson? He said, and that's when I tripped over. <laughs> um, you released three cookbooks. That's so random, right? I find that out. Was that just put your name on it and make a few quid? It wasn't me. It was yeah. nothing to do. That was a, I did a Cross and Blackwell advert for cooking sauces. And that's why. And then they put out a book. But I've, yeah. I'm, a, I'm accredited with uh, that. I'm down as the writer of those. There's nothing to do. Yeah. You played loads of frames of snooker with people because of were frame of Davis. The one I loved when I looked at was you played a frame of snooker with Eric Morecambe. And, and maybe at the time you go, OK, that was a decent day. But like when you just see... Like when you look back and on on how much of a genius that guy was, and you got to be part of his skit, he passed money to the referee and all things like that. Like you know, you ha- you comedy acted with Eric Morecambe. I did two things. I can't believe, uh, uh, amongst others, I was on the Fast Show as well. Did a Fast yes. Show sketch. I loved it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah Morecambe Wise. It was on the Christmas show. I, uh, the sketches were on the Christmas show. Morecambe Wise one year. It was like twenty odd million people watching, and I was in their company. And we did a we did a sketch, and then Cannon and Ball in their prime. Yes, we did a sketch. I did a sketch with them in front of live audience in the studio, shaking like a leaf. But how much fun to move into those circles, but with genuine heroes of comedy, yeah. and to use the snooker vehicle. And I was obviously involved in plenty of this going on, and to play the straight person, or whatever I had to do. Yeah. What a thrill! Yeah. What a thrill! Well, I'm going to finish by saying that even though this is a sports series, it's good to have a musician on. <laughs> you can see the Utopia Strong at touring with Steve Hillage in June and October. I'm assuming a summer with festivals as well. Yeah. Back to Glasgow, is that happening for sure? Fingers crossed. Hopefully, yeah. That's a yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Cheers, thanks. <laughs> it's not actually yes. It's not a yes yet. You see what happens is they get the big X and then all, then all the crowd they just uh, yes. <laughs> they, they call you they call you up with a week to go. You know. <laughs> Steve, thank you, mate. Absolutely really appreciate pleasure. it. Uh, uh, I'll send the invoice through. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay yeah. Great. Just don't send me your next album. No, no. Oh, <laughs> that's so hurtful. <laughs> Bye, mate. Cheers, mate.